Uh, good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 19th meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. Um, apologies have been received from David Stewart. And can I also welcome Willie Coffey, who has joined us for our evidence session uh, this morning. Can I also welcome the Reverend George White, Clerk of the Presbytery and Acting Clerk of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, who will be observing our proceedings this morning. Agenda item one is digital single market. Uh, the committee will take oral evidence from Gail Kent, Director of Resources in DG Connect Europe and at the European Commission on the Digital Single Market. Can I welcome Ms Kent to the meeting and invite her to make an opening statement? Good morning. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I feel <coughs> very honoured to be visiting the Scottish Parliament. It feels a little bit like I'm on, on the television. I mean, because I've seen it so often on the television. <coughs> I'm uh, indeed a director of DG Connect, um, which is the digital DG of the European Commission. We have about um, 1,200 staff. I mainly deal with the um, budget for the huge research program that we have and with staff matters and procedural matters internally. But, of course, I'm also part of the management board of DG Connect, and therefore I'm involved in the policy decisions as well. Um, so just to say, of course, that I'm therefore not a technical specialist, but I hope to give you a good overview and to answer your questions. Um, but I promise to come back to you if I'm unable to answer any questions uh, and send the, off, uh, the, the answers through our Edinburgh office um, if I need to. So my objective here today um, is to confirm the Commission's commitment to achieving a fully functional European Union digital single market and to tell you a little bit more about the Commission's plans for realising it. Digital technologies and the internet are transforming entire business sectors with major impacts on the labour market and society at large. Our European strategy for the creation of a digital single market provides the necessary strong and unitary European level action to address the scale of the economic and social changes brought about by digital in general. Our overall objective is clear. The digital single market must enable the free movement of goods, persons, services and capital. Citizens and businesses must be able to access and use online activities under the conditions of fair competition, irrespective of their nationality or their place of residence. Today, regulatory fragmentation is holding Europe back. In particular, startups and SMEs, who are the key to sustained recovery and job creation, suffer from regulatory fragmentation. They don't have the resources of larger competitors to deal with up to 28 different regulatory regimes. Furthermore, the lack of a digital single market is putting European players at a disadvantage at a critical time in the development of the digital economy. Now is the time when the shares in the new data-driven economy, based on the Internet of Things, are being parceled out. It is also a critical time for the rollout of high-speed wireless networks and services, requiring more efficient coordination and enforcement at EU level. We've seen this happen before. Digital markets punish those who arrive too late. In certain segments, like for internet search, communications and social media, or e-commerce platforms, European players are largely absent. We cannot allow the same thing to happen with the infrastructure and services enabling connected cars, smart homes, smart grids, self-manufacturing, etc., we need to realise that for many issues, the European level offers the right framework. European solutions ensure keeping the EU on equal footing with other major world economies. The European Commission <clears throat> adopted its digital single market strategy on the 6th of May. It is among the top three priorities of this Commission and President Juncker, and we therefore recognise the urgency to act. Clearly, it has to be something in which we don't sort of sit around for the whole of President Juncker's mandate, because by then the whole regulatory framework and the technical framework will have changed. 
The strategy consists of three main pillars and 16 concrete policy actions which are mutually reinforcing. The first part of the uh, DSM is improving access to online goods and services across Europe. We want in the Commission to prevent unjustified geo-blocking and to modernize our copyright framework. We also need to adapt our consumer rules to the borderless nature of online trading. Secondly, digital networks and innovative services. We need to overhaul our telecoms regulations and address issues such as combating illegal online content or strengthening cybersecurity. We must also take a look at the increasingly central role that platforms have in the digital economy. And the third pillar is maximizing the growth potential of the digital economy. We would like a strong data-driven economy taking advantage of emerging technologies and boosting innovation. But we also want to ensure that European citizens have the necessary skills to work with and benefit from the significant advantages that ICT solutions bring in their day-to-day -day life. Our aim is to act swiftly and coherently across institutions to deliver on the digital single market strategy. We want to see real tangible change by 2017. However, we're conscious that we have to take into account all of the views of the member states, and all of the legislative initiatives will undergo rigorous consultation and impact assessment before their adoption by the Commission. We need the Scottish Government and Scottish citizens to get fully involved and present their views during the consultation process. So I'll just say a little bit a word about the consultations. We have started implementing the digital single market actions and as a first step we will engage with the widest audience of stakeholders through public consultations. We have started to consult the public on the future of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive and the Satellite and Cable Directive. We have launched a public consultation on the future of the regulatory framework on telecoms. And we have launched or are about to launch public consultations on prohibiting unjustified geo-blocking and on online platforms, including topics such as the economic and social impact of platforms the liability of online intermediaries, and the sharing economy. These consultations will feed into a rigorous assessment, allowing the Commission to find the best solutions to address the problems identified in the digital single market strategy. Before the end of 2015, the Commission will come forward with a legislative proposal on the modernization of the EU's copyright regime. In 2015, the Commission will launch a comprehensive assessment of the role played by online platforms in the European economy and society. And in the first half of 2016, the Commission will come forward with a legislative proposal on prohibiting unjustified geo-blocking. <clears throat> in the course of 2016, the Commission will also make proposals on the review of the telecoms framework and the audiovisual media services directive. But all of these will be after having read the results of the consultations which are currently open. So I think that's uh, an overview of the situation. Um, I do have a, a small PowerPoint which I didn't use today but which I will send to the Scotland office afterwards and which can be distributed. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for that. And perhaps I could kick off just by asking you um, what success looks like. You, you obviously um, the, the digital uh, single market strategy uh, is in its infancy, uh, having only been launched in May of this year. Uh, but you've said this morning that you expect to see real tangible change by 2017. So how, how do you intend to measure whether there has been progress in the short to medium term? I think, um, Kavina, I think the... The um, what will be adopted in 2017 is more the framework. So I mean, I'm not so we're not so naive as to think we're going to change the world in the next couple of years. It's more laying out the groundwork for for changing the world and also for for changing the whole um, atmosphere in Europe towards uh, towards di the digital market. 
um, what we really want to do is to to improve the situation for businesses within Europe. So the strategy will reduce costs and uncertainty for online traders. And many online traders, in particular the small ones, are afraid of the costs and uncertainties of dealing with the law of a different country. 57% of online traders confirm that if the same rules were applied in Europe, they would start or increase their sales to other countries. And we also, by dealing with the questions of cybersecurity, of data protection, we want to give the consumers confidence because a lot of consumers say that their um, primary concern, although a lot of people put a lot of data out there, in fact, without really thinking about it as well, but their primary concern is a lot of data is circulating about themselves and they're not really very confident that the data is kept confidential. Um, so I think that, I mean, our, it, it will take, by the end of next year, if we put forward the proposals next year, and then it has to go through the council and things like that. So I think that the situation won't change immediately. But our aim is to, to give European businesses the confidence to move forward in the digital area rather than relying on principally um, businesses from other countries like yeah, I mean, North you've, America. You've set out uh, some of the, the benefits of the, the digital single market, but how will you measure uh, progress in achieving um, the, the, the different pillars that you've outlined this morning. You've talked about the better online access to digital goods and services, an environment where digital networks and services can prosper, you know, digital as a, a driver for, for economic growth. And how do we measure success in each of these? Well, we have a number of scoreboards um, which we use in order to measure success. Um, so things like um, the amount of uh, cross-border <coughs> trade that goes on in the digital market in Europe at the moment, which is only 4% cross-border at the moment. So we were able to measure things like that. Um, <coughs> also, um, the um, broadband speeds and whether... Um, People are happy with the broad, broadband speeds, so we have we have a we have a, a um, an index thing which is called DESI, D E S I, which I'm not sure what it stands for to be absolutely honest. But um, <clears throat> we're looking at you know the percentage of internet users which shop online, um, um, the percentage of people who access audiovisual content, and also across borders. Um, the number of people who are interested in watching or listening to content abroad and whether they're able to achieve it or not, um, information on whether businesses feel that delivery costs are too high and or consumers think the delivery costs are too high, um, and then a lot of information which is available on connectivity. Um, and then um, conf things to do with confidence. So, for example... Um, what concern people have when using the internet for things like banking or shopping online um, compared, to, compared to, to world figures or f comparing between different countries, um, percentage of people involved in digital uh, skills. So that there is a, there's a whole kind of wealth of, of in indexes which, um, which will be looked at and which we aim to improve over the period of... Um, of, well, of this commission and then onwards, obviously. Okay. Um, clearly, you know, one of the biggest barriers um, to achieving all of this is the fact that the, the European Union single market is 500 million people and 28 member states, all of whom potentially have their own regulatory framework and rules. So how, how do you intend to address that? Well... This will be this will be one of the hardest things to get through because if you look at the um, the um, telecoms um, single market, which only went through recently in the um, the European Council, there has been a lot of resistance from the member states because there's a lot of interest, individual interest within the the member states. But I think we have to get the member states to understand that it's in their interest to to try to harmonise as much as possible, or at least to agree standards which will be acceptable in all countries. 
in order to open up the market because it's in nobody's interest if we keep the markets fragmented. And although some of the countries like the UK has very strong um, companies involved in competition in other member states, um, they're also often the countries which, which argue against the, the harmonization. But I think it will open up their markets. So that's how, that's how we intend to, to convince people. And then I think we have to have the consumers. We have to have the consumers on our side. So it's not just a matter of protecting um, strong individual countries in national, in national administrations, but also um, involving the citizen more fully in, the, in these decisions. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to move on to some uh, specific issues. Alec, you have some questions. Uh, yes, indeed. <coughs> uh, I note that the European Commission considers that the take-up of broad, uh, fast broadband is relatively low. Uh, are you in a position to be give us any indication as to how Scotland compares with countries across Europe in terms of the take-up of fast broadband? Um, we certainly see a risk of a divide between those member states that are developing ambitious broadband plans to develop a future-proof infrastructure and those that might be tempted by a more modest upgrade of existing networks. As you know, the um, Commission's ambition is for all member states to provide access to speeds in excess of 30 Mbps, which is megabits per second, which I always have to look up each time. Um, by 2020, with 50% of all European households subscribing to ultra-fast speeds of more than 100 Mbps. So some countries are more ambitious. Germany aims to provide speeds of 50 um, Mbps to all households by 2018, while Sweden aims to provide access to speeds of 100 um, to 40% of premises by 2015 and 90% by 2020. So in comparison, the UK government's rural broadband program is more modest. Um, I know that you've also set out your aim to establish a network making superfast broadband available to 90% of premises across Scotland by this year and universally available by 2020. Um, in order... So I think the... I have actually some information on... On Ireland, and I think, for example, in Ireland, they've done something more um, radical. If I can find the information which I wrote down somewhere. So Ireland, I think, are, living, are using a different system. They started more from from scratch. Can you just give me a minute to look up the information? So, so I have actually. Yeah, so um, in Ireland, there's a joint venture between uh, Vodafone and the Electricity Supply Board deploying fibre to the building using the existing electricity networks, and they will soon launch a tender for um, an ambitious national broadband plan with higher, with higher speeds, mm -hmm. for example. So there's, there's a lot of differences. I mean, at the moment, within, um, within uh, Europe, UK is relatively strong, I think sixth the sixth of the 28 countries. Yeah. But other people have more ambitious plans, I believe. I was interested to hear some of the things you were saying about Ireland there. Uh, I have to say that in within the last year, I've had a case that uh, involved someone moving into a new house that hadn't been wired for a traditional phone system. Uh, we're very disappointed here that we're not seeing new housing in particular being uh, cabled with fibre. Uh, mm -hmm. because it's the easiest thing to do. Have you any idea what standards are being imposed in other European countries as for the provision of cabling in new homes? N not, not in de no, not for new mm -hmm. homes. I, I don't know, but I could find out for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Mike. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. I represent the Highlands and Islands, and... Um, although it's a wonderful area to represent, one of the problems is that as soon as you step over what we used to call the Highland Line, you also step over the digital divide um, in as much as uh, both fixed line and mobile broadband provision is very poor. It's the kind of medieval equivalent on the map of here there be dragons. So... Um, <clears throat> Possibly, but we don't know that because we're uh, unable to communicate properly. And the, 
So it's a it's a big issue with my constituents, and quite recently, the uh, John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister and um, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, was giving evidence to the committee, and he was talking about the provision of uh, broadband or, or the fibre uh, optic backbone, which will support um, high-speed broadband across the Highlands and Islands. And the Scottish Government has spent 127 million on the provision of that for the Highlands and Islands. Um, he agreed with me on that occasion that it would be better for this to be dealt with by regulation. And, of course, telecommunications are reserved to the Westminster government. Um, is there anything that um, can be done at EU level uh, to encourage a universal service obligation or something similar that would allow my constituents access to uh, high-speed connectivity, whether it's fixed or mobile. And moving on to the mobile side, is there anything that can be done to um, improve encouragements of access to 4G across the Highlands and Islands and other rural parts of Scotland? Apologies for that being such a long question. <laughs> I think in the Commission we're very conscious that there is an investment gap and that it needs to be filled. Um, so there was an estimate done um, by my DG, DG Connect, in, um, on the gap that needs to be plugged if member states are to reach um, the last broadband targets, so the universal coverage and the um, the... Uh, subscription of 50% of households to, to faster um, coverage. <clears throat> and according to these estimates, Europe needs 34 billion euro to reach the target of 100% coverage at 30 Mbps and 92 billion if we wanted to reach the 100 um, Mbps to 50% of households. So there are a number of things which which are available, but we feel need to be better leveraged in the in the next few years um, to help these things out. So there's the European Structural Investment Funds for Broadband, um, which is currently estimated at 5.5 billion, can help plug in gaps, um, and we're hoping also to leverage 150 million to broadband under the Connecting Europe facility, which is the new the new um, program, <coughs> which has um, which is looking at better connections in transport, energy, and and um, connectivity across Europe, and then the Juncker plan, which is in its very early days yet, um, which is called FC, I think EFSI, um, which is looking to work with the European Investment Bank to to leverage funds from the private sector in order to encourage people to invest in. Um, in broadband and mobile phone provision in, in outlying areas. So these are something we would expect to come out as um, very substantial things as a result of the DSM strategy. So to, to focus these funds which have been existing for a while in some cases into the things which are more needed. But, but not any uh, regulatory attempts to make, uh, you know, to create some kind of universal service obligation then? Well, I think in terms of the telecoms, we're, we're looking at the telecoms framework. And, and so I'm sure, well, you know, the Commission <coughs> loves to introduce it, regulatory things, but the member states aren't usually so so keen on it. But uh, I would think as a re we're, we're doing this um, review at the moment, and as a result of that, I would think we would also look at, at minimum standards that we would expect to be implemented. But this is something that we would find very interesting for you to feed into the, the consultations that are going on at the moment, whether, whether that indeed would be helpful. Okay, thank you. And are you aware of any innovative uh, examples for, of 4G provision across the EU? Um, you know, sometimes it's said that Scotland's geography, particularly in the Highlands and Islands, mitigate against the rollout of high-speed broadband. So are you... But other, other countries have similar challenges and yet some of them seem to achieve better provision than we have here. Are you aware of any examples of good practice or innovative practice that could um, help us understand what's possible? Mm. 
Well, today investment is happening in Europe and, and private operators are investing. Um, and so the, the surge of, um, of LTE, um, long-term evolution, so mobile phone coverage, is also very positive. But, you know, we understand that we can't expect private operators to go everywhere. Um, we, we believe that we should support operators to reach those areas that would not be covered otherwise. Um, I, don't, I don't actually have um, any particular examples, but I'm sure there are examples. I can, again, I can find it out for you. So examples of where they've improved 4G coverage. Yeah, just yes. innovative examples. But yeah. Perhaps they're dealing with difficult terrain, difficult topography, difficult geography. Maybe if I move on to, to, to another area, um, because you'll be, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll be as horrified as, as I am continually uh, to realise that my constituents are dealt, you, 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 you get a double whammy, because not only are they, um, uh, have, the, have the difficulties of very, few, very poor connectivity, but when they do manage to get a message through to a supplier and post an order, um, they're then faced with very high delivery charges. Um, that seems very much to be part of this equation. Will the Commission's work address the issue of high delivery charges across the Highlands and Islands? And mm -hmm. in fact, in some cases, we get some suppliers that say, we don't like your postcode and we're not going to deliver there. And it's a frequent complaint from my constituents. Once again, um, those matters are reserved to the UK Parliament, not this one. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wonder if there's anything that, that you can do to address this difficult issue. So, um, indeed, recent studies confirm the cost of delivery is still an obstacle to cross-border uh, shopping, or even within, in fact, to a certain extent. Shipping costs are the most common reason uh, in Europe, in general, for consumers not completing an online purchase. 62% of companies that are willing to sell online say that too high delivery costs are a problem for them. So it's on both sides, in fact. The consumers don't like it, obviously, because it's not interesting. And then the, the companies don't like it either because the, the costs are high and therefore it becomes inefficient. <clears throat> and tariffs for cross-border small parcel delivery charged by postal operators are often two to five times higher than domestic prices. So, for example, it costs €32.40 Euro to send a two-kilo parcel from Belgium to Austria, um, which is five times the, the price it would cost to send within Belgium. And uh, the other way around, different, different, uh, different prices, but also big, big differences too. Um, so, I mean, the question is, are we planning to regulate cross-border delivery prices? We believe that competition appears to be the most appropriate and effective way of addressing today's concerns in terms of affordability. However, in order for the competition to work in a fair and efficient manner, all the market participants, retailers, delivery operators, as well as consumers, need to enjoy a certain degree of price transparency. So often you only discover these things when you're halfway through the, through the purchase. We believe that price regulation is only a means of the last resort <clears throat> where competition doesn't bring satisfactory results and is not being and so at the moment it's not being considered, but it could be considered. We consider it better to close monitor the situation and to try and address any market failures. Um, so the intention is to review it after a, a couple of years if it doesn't work. But again, it's something because we t there's a, a whole section also to do with parcel deliveries in the consultation. So we're interested in um, knowing people's points of points of view. Okay, thank you. And um, <coughs> the, the final area again, I'm just moving on to a slightly different aspect of this. But the committee uh, recently undertook an inquiry into freight transport. Uh, the, uh, the freight transport system that serves Scotland. Um, and one aspect of that inquiry was looking at how um, that industry might reduce carbon emissions. Is, you know, if we're looking at an increased uh, online business, digital business, with 
um, increased shipping and freight that that implies? Is the Commission looking at how that can be best done in, in, in order to ensure that um, we're, we're make, making best use of low carbon transport? Well, I guess I would expect that the Commission is looking at that, but probably it isn't in my DG, so I hadn't actually um, got an answer to it. So the, the problem is you think that by having more online deliveries, it will create there will be more lorries and therefore the, the cost... Yeah, yeah, that's the logic, and mm. it's, it, it, I think it's probably an escapable logic. Yeah. Um, so obviously, given the low carbon, carbon agenda, we'll, we'll look at yeah. increasing freight, which is good, but decreasing the carbon output of that freight system if we can. So, um, But perhaps that's something you can maybe have a think about. Well, I think, I mean, the, there are five, I think, five DGs working together on the digital um, single market strategy. Um, so I'm sure that somewhere within there, there is a, there is a policy on how to, to deal with the fact that there would be increased uh, carbon emissions as a result of an increase in, in, in parcel delivery and delivering online. So I'll, I'll find out for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Adam. Uh, uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I'd like to sort of return to some of your opening remarks that uh, you were uh, highlighting the predicament of small SMEs, uh, small businesses in particular. Only 7% of SMEs in the EU sell cross-border, but... Uh, Small online businesses wishing to trade in another EU country face around €9,000 extra costs um, for having to adapt to, to national laws, including maybe up to 5000 for uh, different VAT regimes. Um, so how, is, how are you going to tackle that? What are the immediate priorities in terms of establishing um, a fair, uh, uh, a fair crack of the whip for SMEs in terms of online business. Um, thank you very much <coughs> for that question. So. The Commission proposes, the Commission intends to propose, I mean, subject to the consultations as well, so these are the things which are in our mind at the moment, um, a solution which ensures that if you're selling, traders selling across borders can apply a single set of terms uh, and conditions domestically and in the internal market, um, whilst guaranteeing consumers in the European Union can enjoy the same high level of European consumer protection which they expect. So we intend to bring forward a proposal which introduces harmonised consumer protection rules for digital content and rules, which will allow traders to rely fully on their national laws with a set of key mandatory consumer protection rules for sales of physical uh, goods. Um, there's there's also the, qu the question which has already been relays, um, related to do with deliveries. Um, where we intend to, to deal with it. The DSM strategy is also providing for common cross-border thresholds for VAT to facilitate small startup businesses. So the level and the type of the thresholds will be considered as part of the impact assessment for the proposal. And we've also started preparatory work on preparing a comprehensive future initiative on reducing the VAT compliance costs for SMEs generally. Um, but I think for for us, really, the most important part and probably the most tangible part is the is the encouragement of the SMEs within Europe. So we see that as absolutely imperative to the success of the DSM process. And and if people if people are if companies are not um, wanting to operate to other countries because they feel that the administrative barriers are, are too high, then 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 the, any digital strategy is a, is a failure. So it has to be the absolute first priority. So, so what are you doing with individual member states to, to promote the benefit 
the benefits that, that, that this these this will bring, this move will bring to but reduce the barriers and allow um, trade uh, to, to to develop. Well, at, as I say, at the moment we're at the consultation stage. So what we've been doing, we have. Um, what we call going local teams in, in the DGs where they go out to individual member states. So there was a, um, a group of um, director generals <coughs> um, had visit, has visited uh, uh, the capitals of, of various states and talked about the digital single market. And I know the UK government is very positive about... Um, about the move. So at the moment, we're more in the kind of marketing stage and the pre-consultation stage of suggesting what we want to do. And, for example, the UK government is very positive about the digital single market strategy. The difficulty will come when it actually comes to the individual regulations and people have to realise what has to be adapted. So I think the important part at the moment is, is getting people on board to the concept. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, you know, digital obviously is going to be the main the main cause of growth in the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years and therefore we need people on board. But we haven't actually got to the stage of um, actually making specific proposals yet. Okay. There's also a lot of work going on to do with um, trying to encourage investment in, in, in these areas. So there's a lot of <coughs> research projects going on and also um, special schemes which exist for SME, SME um, projects. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Siobhan. The fact sheet that you provided um, the committee before today's meeting um, said that almost half of the EU population, 47%, um, is not properly digitally skilled, and yet jobs for the future, 90% um, of those jobs would require some level of digital skill. So how is the Commission assisting the member states in closing the digital skills gap, both in the general population and in the workplace, particularly in small businesses? Mm. So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a huge shortage of digital skills within the whole of the EU. Um, in the UK, um, also in Scotland, of course, the whole, um, there's a, a shortage of ICT professionals, um, which is expected to increase, in fact, up to 2020, and demand is outstripping supply. And not enough young people are being trained for ICT careers. So education is a... Um, what's the word they use? Anyway, it's not a commission. It's not a pro commission prerogative. It's a it's a, a member state prerogative. So we try to work with the member states to to find solutions. Um, <clears throat> we have um, a, we have a grand what's called the Grand Coalition for Jobs, um, which is getting the member states to work with different stakeholders in order to have a collaborative effort to increase the number of people working in these areas. We also have um, you know, various member states, including the UK, introducing coding and things into school education. <clears throat> I mean, the UK, I think, has been working on digital skills issues for a while um, and had the first um, national collaboration um, there's a new computing curricula in schools, um, and I know in Scotland you also have the skills investment plan and also Plan C, I think, is it, too? So these are the things that we, we see as uh, are very important to the future. In your answer, you mentioned schools a few times, and in Scotland we've got a problem um, recruiting and retaining computing teachers in particular at the minute. Um, so I'm just wondering, would the Commission see themselves in that role to assist and, and helping develop programmes in order to keep people um, in those skills and, and to promote those, because obviously that's part of the STEM subjects that maybe females don't feel attracted to. Is that something the Commission um, would look at working with a member state on, or do you feel that's a role simply for the member state? Well, I think it is a role for the member states. Well, I mean, legally it's a role for the member states, but I don't think the Commission can kind of sit on the sidelines because it's absolutely um, very important. So we try to give a lot of publicity to to things where we increase the number of ICT people uh, and we, we also you know meet stakeholders and talk about uh, women in tech for example and um, encouraging young people to go more into st to stem subjects but I think we are reliant on working with the member states in terms of of um, 
taking best practices from various member states and and rolling them out into into other countries and and uh, getting people to work with stakeholders in 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 the particular member states. I mean, we don't we don't have funding per se for that. You just spoke about best practice. So are there examples of, of trying to close that digital skills gap in other member states that Scotland in particular could learn from? Um, well, I think it actually, it, you know, it's not much help because everything is a matter of perspective, isn't it? So, I mean, the, the, the big example that always gets given uh, in Europe is, in fact, about the idea of introducing coding skills for primary schools, which is actually a UK initiative in any case. So, uh, <coughs> But... Um, um, I, I think some countries have have developed sort of partnerships with local businesses to increase the number of apprenticeships and things like that. But I'm not aware of any particular best practices. But again, I could I could ask and come back to you. That would be helpful. Thank you, uh, Willie. Did you want to come in on the digital skills gap? Uh, not in the not in the gap itself, but just other issues. Convener, if it's right. In that case, I'll, I'll I'll get you to hold your fire until okay. other members have asked their questions. Okay, um, Alex. I have a, a couple of questions that are really subjects we've touched on already, and I just wanted to uh, make sure we've got all the information. Uh, the first one is, uh, as you've said already, there's a, a good deal of work going on uh, to future-proof digital networks. But is there anything else the Commission's doing to ensure that the rollout of broadband in EU countries is future-proofed? So pr future-proofed in, in what sense? That we've uh, already uh, thought about... As in that the networks are able to uh, perform functions and operate at rates that are significantly higher than the ones that we're currently talking about. Okay. So, the review of the telecoms regulatory framework is part of the digital single market. Um, and all digital services and applications depend on the availability I think we, what we believe is that we need to understand better what kind of networks will be needed by 2025. So we know that new services ranging from e-health um, to connected cars will have the potential to become available quickly if the required connectivity is available. So we have to make sure that the regulatory framework provides the right um, conditions for operators to invest in those networks and for consumers and businesses to benefit from high quality connectivity so again this is one of the things we're looking at in the in the public consultation um, we've started an evaluation of current rules by launching a public consultation um, of the, of the framework um, and although we haven't actually had the results of the consultation yet we can see po perhaps four areas for the forthcoming review so the first is investment in networks um, EU telecoms rulebook is often criticised for not having sufficiently promoted the transition towards high capacity next generation access for future needs. So we want to look now at how to make investments in higher capacity networks rewarding and adjustments to the current rules are probably necessary in order to increase the incentives. And we need to also, in the regulations, take account of the state of technological development of networks and the number of networks available in a different area. Um, and since the current market regulation doesn't provide effective tools to address those circumstances, we want to explore options to enlarge public authorities' toolbox to, in to incentivize operators to deploy networks in challenging areas. Um, since the last review in 2009, uh, the last telecoms review, the sector has undergone significant structural changes characterised by the transition from copper to fibre, the more complex competition with the convergence of fixed and mobile networks and the rise of retail bundles. Um, so at the moment, voice, voice is no longer the main service as an access to connectivity. Um, the emergence of these over-the-top um, systems brought new dynamics into the services side and consumers' habits have changed. Um, and everyone is more dependent on high-speed broadband. So what we need to do in the, in the review, we believe, is to, to look at these particular areas and try and 
and try and estimate what will happen in the next few years and make sure that we're ahead of the game rather than behind the game, which has always been the situation up to now. I can certainly vouch for the fact that voice is no longer the most common use of landlines. The only voice calls I get are unsolicited marketing calls. It's terrible, isn't it? The, the, the other thing I wanted to ask about is you've touched already on the common regulatory framework. Uh, and I just wanted to explore that a little more. You suggested that uh, in some countries, perhaps this country, it was more the, the, the providers uh, who were resistant to competition rather than the government. But in terms of European governments as a whole, which are uh, or where is uh, the common regulatory framework finding favour and where is it being opposed? Well, I'm not actually sitting in the discussions in the Council. and I think... I suspect it's the big. I suspect it's the bigger countries who are more resistant, mm -hmm. because they have the bigger companies with the most with the most to lose. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect, but I don't. I don't actually know. And if you look at the countries that have been the most innovative, they're often the ones with the least background in these things. I mean, obviously, Estonia is the. Because my vice president, uh, Ansip, is Estonian, so I'm always hearing about Estonia. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Estonia is the is the country that has really sort of started from scratch and 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 has the most excellent system in terms of not only in terms of uh, also in terms of e-government. I think where they're extremely advanced. Mm -hmm. My experience of uh, certainly mobile telecoms uh, in larger European countries is that the trend has been for companies to extend their networks across uh, borders and then offer single services that cross borders. So are we in a situation where perhaps the companies are making more progress than the, the countries are at the moment? Well, I, I can't answer that from a statistical point of view, but I think you, 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 may, be, you, you, know, you may well be right, yes. Mm. I think that, that is the case. Well, still, that's quite a good thing if... Uh, well, yes, it's a good thing. Cause yeah. <laughs> If, because companies in the end will push push mm. governments which are resistant, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, James. Thank you, Vina. Uh, good morning, Miss Kent. Uh, I've got a couple of questions around competition. Ofcom, uh, I've told the committee that it expects the Commission to look at ways to simplify or reduce regulation where there's an infrastructure competition and seek to further incentivise the development of high capacity networks through ensuring returns on investment reflect risks while protecting competition. Did you get all that? Uh, um. <laughs> does Ofcom's view match the Commission's intended approach to the review of regulatory framework? And if not, where does it differ? Well, as I say, we're in the draft stages at the moment anyway, so yeah, I also have read, I, I can't see anything in the Ofcom, in the, um, in the Ofcom statement that, that's, that the Commission would object to at all. Um, so we also see that it's very important to, to keep things as simple as possible and to, to, to deregulate where, where it's possible and to have more uniformity between, between the regulations that, that do exist. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, when there was a meeting um, at UK government level er, early in this year, there was very strong support for the digital single market, and 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 I think we're, I mean, the UK is traditionally a, a country which is in favour of um, making things simple and minimising regulation, except where it's absolutely necessary, and and um, promoting competition. So. Um, we would be we would be surprised if there was a lot of resistance. I'm sure. So. I'm sure we'll be keeping an eye on it to see if you still have the same the two you still have the same kind of views later on. When uh, the paper yes, yes. Thank you. I've got one one other aspect of it. Uh, I think the devil is in the detail, as they say. Well, I think so. that's also Ofcom's view. To <laughs> Which, be fair. And the detail is yet yes. to come, of course. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a recent report in the media which highlighted a range of internet costs for cons consumers across Europe with prices in the UK as much as 50% more than other EU countries. Will the DSM help bring parity to internet costs across Europe, or does the Commission consider competition to be a matter for individual member states? Does the Commission consider competition to be a member? <coughs> I, the commi the 
I think the commission is in favor of, of competition, but it certainly doesn't consider it to be only a matter for individual member states because if we all took very individualistic views of the way that the market worked, then we'd be looking at these tiny little markets. And I think the big thing about um, the successful uh, computing internet companies is that they're operating in a huge market. Um, so... Um, I think we have to do everything. We have to take the the beliefs and the in in the free market economy that exist in 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 some member states more than others, but we also at the same time have to make sure that they're not protecting their own markets and so that so that competition to their markets is also open to companies from other countries and and vice versa. Yeah, it does seem to be counterintuitive to what you're you're talking about with the digital yeah. single market. Yeah. In any if, case, there's no. There's no border, is there? I mean, so for, for digital services, there is no border. And it can be quite infuriating, well, as you know, if you're moving around between countries when you, you find you can't access something which you had in one country or which you even bought in one country and you can't access it in, a, in another country. OK. Uh, OK, then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Willie Coffey has been waiting patiently, so I'm going to ask him to come in. Thanks, thanks very much, convener, and thanks for allowing me to attend the... The committee today, uh, members may know I'm a member of the European Committee and I also convene the cross-party group in digital participation and for my sins I'm a former software engineer in another life. Uh, so I, I have an interest in a number of these issues but firstly at the outset I would say I don't envy your task Miss Kent that, that you have ahead of you and a number of these issues have been raised at our European Committee over the past year or so. Um, the, the first question I wanted to, to touch on with you is about the, the great roaming rip-off, the roaming charges rip-off. We're aware that roaming charges were supposed to have been abolished by December this year and that, that has been pushed out. And I now understand it might be June 2017 before roaming charges are finally uh, pushed out of the, the, the picture in Europe. What I cannot find out, convener, Miss Kent, is where that decision was taken, because it was certainly part of the Commission's plans to, to, to end roaming charges, but where and when and who took the decision to push this out to 2017? Would you be able to tell us that? Well, the final decision on, uh, on the... Um, the TSM, DSM to TSM, we're all initials. In. Um, the TSM package was actually taken just before the summer. By So there was agreement, final agreement in the council before the summer. Because I remember in, in our DG we had a, <coughs> a thing saying you know, the, end of the death of roaming. So we, we had a kind of celebration uh, on our internet for the death of, uh, the death of roaming. Um, so I would... I don't actually know, but I would assume that the decision on the timing of it came out in the final decision, maybe part of the compromise to get it through, because it stalled for a long time, as you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing, was to actually push the dates out slightly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid I don't actually have the information on it, but I can definitely find out. So Wait, you think it was, it was nobody, until next summer? Nobody seems to know. But the Roman charges I'm sure were somebody, meant, I'm sure somebody, somebody must know, knows. But the Roman charges were meant to end in December, as you, as you know. No, yes, no, you, I knew they were due to end. In fact, I wasn't even aware myself that, they were, yeah. that it was next yeah. year. As you know, convener, the first thing you do when you go abroad outside your jurisdiction is to throw your mobile phone in the drawer. <laughs> because it's far too expensive to use. And, and it, it seems to me and others that, that, that the Commission and perhaps the Member States have buckled under the pressure of mobile companies to, to push this decision further out. And even the proposal now will still provide exceptions to this, but they haven't defined what these exceptions might be. Mm -hmm. So as a consumer of mobile services, if you are lucky enough to be able to travel around jurisdictions, and let's not forget, convener, Technology doesn't recognise borders, but mobile companies sure do. Mm. And they exploit it to the hilt to make money at the expense of consumers. So it was just to touch base with you on that to see where the pressure might be coming from to finally get rid of roaming charges and a date that we can all um, look forward to actually happening in reality. 
But there definitely has been an agreement, but as I say, perhaps the date is not. But I, I think even there must be, a, I will definitely find, it, find you out the information. And I, and I absolutely agree. I mean, my own, personal, <coughs> my own personal view is that, yes, there has been buckling to, to pressure <laughs> from... Okay, could I ask another question, please, convener? Um, mm. uh, you'll probably be aware, too, that the, the last um, agreement, the MAF agreement, the MAF framework agreement, we saw a £7 billion Euro cut and the IT infrastructure provision that was intended at the time. And it, it seems to me that while the strategy quite correctly focuses on access to goods and services and making that all available throughout a single market, it, it seems to me that you, you, you really need to have a almost a transport infrastru infrastructure for data that's capable of delivering those goods and services. So the focus on goods and services without the transport infrastructure for data seems a wee bit round the wrong way. <laughs> it was to ask you, where are the pressures, where, where is the technical expertise within the Commission and the European Union to, to make sure that, that decision makers and policy makers are aware of that? It's a bit convenient, like expecting goods and services to be transported around the motorway network without investing in the motorway transport system to get the, the goods and services there. I suppose that's the best analogy I can think of, Convener. So it concerns me that decisions like that that are so crucial to the delivery of content and digital services are sometimes taken in reverse of the way that they perhaps should be. So um, thank you, Mr. Roy. So the question to do when you say the amount was cut, you mean from the from the um, the, last the multi annual yeah. Yeah. The frame. Last yeah. yeah. Billion yeah. Off the Up until two thousand and twenty yeah. or yeah. Seven <coughs> it's true that they I mean I think the original well I think it goes without saying that RDG is in favour of maximizing expenditure on that kind of thing and minimizing it on another uh, on other policy areas where which uh, us where money is spent on the MFF, um, so uh, I would I would absolutely agree with you. And there was definitely a cut in the an amount that would be given to ICT infrastructure um, during the the final in the final decision on the MFF, which was taken by the the member states and the and the European Parliament. Um, there will be a review of the MFF in um, 2017. We've already started working on that. And I think there is, as I understand it, this would also have to go through the same um, uh, council and parliament, of course. There is no intention to increase the amount of the MFF as a whole, but I would imagine there is some scope to, to move things between the various lines of, of the MFF. And I would suspect that uh, um, President Juncker will be in favour of... of of increasing expenditure on, on on things related to which are necessary to the digital single market because it's really his number one priority. Um, so I would I would expect there will be some changes, some increases put forward, but of course they will still meet the same um, resistance that they met the last time. However, you know life has moved on in the meantime, so perhaps now people will will see digital as more important investment than it than it was when it was discussed in 2012 and 2013. Mm -hmm. Convener, it probably goes a long way towards explaining why you've got such a disparity in the member states in terms of our ability to, de to deliver digital services. And you, you read out some examples of the targets that Germany and Sweden and, and so on and so forth have. That's why there's such a disparity in my view, is because the, their own investment in digital infrastructure is really largely up to, to them. And th th this huge cut in the digital infrastructure budget clearly must have an impact, otherwise... I would, you know, seven billion pound must uh, euros must have an impact on that. So unless that kind of issue is addressed, mm -hmm. uh, to invest in the infrastructure right across the European Union, you're going to continue to see fragmented delivery, in my view, and different quality of service within the, the member states, which is completely out with the scope and the aims and purposes of the digital single market. Um, have I time for one last question? Can you? <laughs> um, you mentioned the you mentioned the Internet of Things in your opening remarks there and, and for members that that's about devices communicating with one another in a much more sophisticated and intelligent way in the future and at our committee only a few weeks ago uh, we heard that this Europe's cyber security agency Enisa, 
don't know if you're in sir. They had, had I'm reading a quote here, convener, they had admitted it is unprepared for the advent of the Internet of Things, lacking the money and expertise to meet these challenges. That, that would be a worry uh, for, for, for me to hear something like that when, when we're seeing such rapid progress towards communication and intelligent communication between devices that, that, that this security, cyber security agency within the European Union feels unprepared for its advent. Do, could you tell us a wee bit more about that and perhaps what's been done to, to try to address it? So, um, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, just just to return a minute to the MFF question, of course, the amount spent on this has incre has increased. In fact, it was what was a what was cut was the amount proposed to, to be spent on it, and I guess probably that's where people got maybe confused when they were making the decision because it seemed like an increase anyway. It wasn't a big enough increase, given the, in my opinion, uh, given the. Uh, the situation um, with the increase in the digital market. <clears throat> um, I think for, I mean, I absolutely agree with you where we see um, cyber security as, as a, a hugely important um, part of the digital single market um, framework. And um, so we expect we, that we expect there to be, and I think it is also to do with people's confidence in the system, um, which we need in order to, to, to boost the market. And um, so we see that some kind of directive on internet security will would be part of the DSM um, framework in order to, to give people reassurance in order to invest and to invest personally as businesses, but also to, to use the systems. Um, so I, I think you're right, they, they are unprepared. Um, Enisa is quite a small, it's quite a small agency anyway, as you, as you know. But I think within within the G, within the Commission, I think the responsibility for cyber security has been um, diffused a bit between various DGs, and now there's a big effort. It, 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 it's it's extremely important to President Juncker that we bring all our work on this together. And so, I mean, I, I think in in our DG, it's after the digital single market um, team, it's the second hottest topic, so I expect it to have a lot of um, thought and input over the next uh, few months. I, mean, I, I sincerely hope so. I'm sure, Convener, you'll be interested in, in following that, that up. I mean, cyber security, if the digital single market opens up and people do engage with technology much, much more than they're perhaps even aware of, the security aspect of that is absolutely cr crucial. And to, to read that there's a, an unpreparedness for this within the European Union is, is a wee bit concerning. So it would be interesting, certainly to me, and I'm sure other members, to follow progress with, with that agenda as it develops. So uh, thank you very much, Convener, for allowing me to attend and ask these questions. And as I said at the outset, I don't envy the task that you have in front of you, Ms Kent, but in, in, I mean, in behalf of, speaking on behalf of consumers and constituents, some of the issues I'm raising I, I think are important to them about costs of accessing and using technology within the European Union and to, to read the aims and objectives of the single digital market are, are wonderful, but that sometimes the delivery is a wee bit less than that. Thank you, Thank you very much, Willie, for your attendance you. and for your, your questions this morning. Um, just bringing your, our session to a close, um, one of the, the points that Mr Coffey was making about the variation in the level of both um, infrastructure investment and also the development of broadband networks across the countries of the European Union, uh, I think is a, an interesting observation. I was just wondering, given that there are a number of factors which impinge on the development of broadband network networks, such as um, geography, particularly remoteness uh, and rurality, uh, and the difficulty of um, making um, you know, achieving connectivity in, in rural and remote areas, population size and density, and obviously legacy infrastructure. Um, what is the attitude of the European Commission when it comes to determining what state aid might be made available? And how does the Commission take these different factors into account when arriving at those decisions? So, I guess... 
<clears throat> you're referring slight, you're referring uh, also, Ms. Kavina, to the um, to the current situation of um, state aid, which was made available, I think, in 2013 for two years um, to the UK in order for the rollout of broadband. So, <clears throat> which has been, if I understand correctly, has been um, stalled um, lately because neither Ofcom, is it Ofcom? Have I got the right? Um, Confused between the different countries, neither off got the Department of Competition anyway in uh, in the UK nor the um, Competition Department in the European Commission are happy with the existing the way that the existing state aid situation has developed. However, um, having spoke, I've tried to speak to the people uh, who are involved in this before I came, and I understand that. Um, there is agreement between the UK and the EU that, that things need to change and they, they are confident that they will find um, a solution uh, to, to the problems and that, the, that therefore they still have hopes that the state aid will be regranted for a, for a further period. Um, I think it's the same for a state aid for this as, as for anything else. I mean... <clears throat> it it just has to be clear that the that the procurement uh, of the services is done in a competitive way and that um, um, yeah that it's not used by individual companies in order to increase their turnover rather than putting things out properly to them to the market if I understand correctly. So okay. it's not that we're against we're not against the state aid, but I think there are, we feel that there are various ways of inc improving the infrastructure. So um, e either state aid or or um, <clears throat> using uh, leveraging um, private funds using the EIB, and so there, there. What we're trying to do at the moment for the Juncker plan is to put together a sort of portfolio of possibilities which which companies and which countries can use in order to improve their um, connectivity. Okay, just following on from that, I mean, the Scottish Government has uh, the ambition of achieving the rollout of superfast broadband to 95% uh, of premises uh, by the year seven, 2017 to 18. Mm. Um, which of course would mean that we still have the 5% of hard to reach premises in Scotland. Does the Commission have a view on what novel or innovative uh, solutions or approaches might be helpful in closing that 5% gap of hard to reach premises? Well, I'm I'm really not an expert on state aid and uh, and, and on these things, but I, I understand that there are um, particular schemes for areas which have very low uh, connectivity and that these can be used. But I'd have to refer back to you. I think is it to do with white areas or something that it, that there are schemes where you can use money in order to help areas which are particularly badly connected. But I'm sure that your digital um, Scotland, uh, I've already looked at those. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, perhaps we could encourage you to talk to each other so that yes. you can get the benefit yes. of, of your expertise <laughs> uh, and as they take these issues forward. Okay. Okay. Do members have any other questions? Uh, are there any other points that you would like uh, to put on the record, Miss Kent? No, not at all. I'm, I, I'm just... It's been really interesting for me yeah. and... Um, to hear your concerns, I think yeah. you know when you're in the commission. You, yeah. one of the reasons why we have this local going local team is to make sure that we're less cut off from the, the member states because we tend to yeah. sit in our policy ivory but we're, towers. We're very pleased that you've um, so, um, it, come out it, of your ivory it, tower it, well, yeah, to visit the Scottish Parliament. I think this, this is. A, I'm very happy in this in this different tower. So. Okay. <laughs> thank um, you very much. Thank you. Can I, can I thank you for your attendance this morning and for your comprehensive evidence? And uh, hopefully this will be the first of a number of uh, sessions where we can uh, have a, a useful and constructive dialogue with the European uh, Commission. And we look forward to receiving some of the follow-up uh, information that you've um, referred to this morning. And also to hearing uh, of the 
the further progress that is made towards achieving the, the digital single market. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, that concludes today's committee business. I now close this meeting of the committee.